Okay, thank you. So to begin our, uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, we have both a wonderful individual from a wonderful company to share with you. So let me first introduce the individual and then a bit about the company. Uh, John Rose is here from Huawei, uh, but before Huawei, John has spent a lot of years uh, in technology businesses, uh, starting among other companies, uh, Broadcom and Nortel, uh, in senior technical leadership roles, including the CTO role of these companies. So a marvelous choice uh, and background for somebody uh, who's now working at Huawei. How many of you have heard of Huawei? How many of you, it's a brand new company? Okay, well I can promise you in another year or two, you will also hear of Huawei. It's already a very, very big and important company, but getting bigger and becoming more important. Uh, and, and John has got an important piece of that. Uh, as he explained to me over lunch, Huawei is a company that's not only done a superb job of being a fast follower of technology standards uh, in the telecom equipment industry, but increasingly is now helping to set standards and direct future technology directions uh, for that industry and as he's going to share with you, uh, some adjacent industries as well. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, John Rose. John. All right, so uh, this will be the most unstructured, random discussion I've had in a while, but uh, it should be a lot of fun. Um, so glad to be here. Uh, uh, the flow of discussion today is, is a bit, uh, bit unusual. We have a, a bit of a presentation with some slides in it. I'm not a big slide fan. I actually don't particularly like PowerPoint, but uh, sometimes it's a necessary evil. That'll actually be towards the middle. Um, what I'm going to do first is, uh, is do a bit of an extended introduction about uh, myself and some of the companies I've been at uh, to talk about their innovation model and, and my role in those companies' innovation. Um, we'll then jump into a bit of a discussion around, uh, for context, uh, a industry transformation. And the reason I think it's a, a germane discussion to have is, you know, one of the reasons why you rethink the way you do innovation is not just so that you can do what you're already doing better, but sometimes you do it because the industry around you or the customer base or your entire environment has changed. And uh, in the case of Huawei, which I'll introduce as a company in a little more detail, uh, our industry is completely transforming. Uh, it's a massive industry of you know, probably $3, or $3 trillion in aggregate sales around the world as a total industry. I'll describe that a little more detail. Um, but it is reshaping in almost uh, every dimension. And if you don't change, you die. You know, we all know the uh, evolutionary theories here. Um, in any event, uh, when we're done with that, uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. Feel free to ask questions as we're going through this, uh, trying to keep it fairly unstructured. Um, hopefully it will be uh, relevant and interesting, but uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. So, so first, uh, as an introduction, uh, again, my name is John Rose. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President, General Manager of Huawei's, well, I guess, uh, North American R&D Centers. For context, uh, what that means is I run an organization that today has a little over 1,000 senior technical staff, mostly 25, 30-year industry veterans. Um, I am responsible for uh, the care and feeding of that organization, but also the, the growth of that organization. Uh, two years ago, the organization was about 200, 300 people. Over the last 18 months, we've grown to almost 1,000. Uh, these, are, again, are more chief scientists, chief technology officers, principal architects from other companies than you probably find in any environment, with a principal charter of driving innovation for arguably the largest uh, globalized technology company to come out of China. I'll give you more demographic information in a bit. We'll come back to Huawei, but before Huawei, I have a, a bit of a history in terms of uh, kind of a repeat act. Uh, I started my career just, uh, I'm a double E by background, hopefully some of you are. Um, I started my career at a company called Cabletron Systems. Uh, Cabletron Systems doesn't exist anymore, kind of disappeared as we broke it into four pieces in around 1999, 2000, but it was one of the largest uh, networking companies uh, in the 90s is a good way to describe it. I actually started as a co-op while I was an undergrad and ultimately became the chief technology officer of the company. The company grew to be about $2 billion in annual sales, about 7,000 employees, and was about 40% of the overall market at that time. 
Uh, from there, I uh, graduated, I guess, into uh, one of its successors, a company called Enterosys Networks. Enterosys is now part of Siemens Enterprise Networks. Uh, its principal focus is around secure enterprise technology, uh, networking that has a security slant to it. Uh, there I was a uh, chief technology officer, and uh, this was during the time of Enron, the dot-com bubble bursting, uh, all the other fun stuff going on. Uh, so I've, uh, I think that was my first SEC investigation I went through in my life, and my second recession. Uh, that's how you measure your, your, your age in this industry. Um, Ultimately, in that job, I was responsible for the technology strategy of creating a, an approach to secure networking. Uh, in that capacity, I was one of the authors of uh, two standards that you probably use today. One is called RFC 3580, and the other is known as 802.1x, which is the security standard for authentication on wireless LANs. So if you ever go into your, if you have your laptop, you can go click on it, look under wireless LAN settings, you'll see something called .1x, and that was myself and Bernardo Boba at Microsoft and Paul Congdon at HP and Vip and Jane and a few other folks. Uh, interesting time because uh, the reason we came up with that standard, just for context, is we're all having a discussion about, you know, in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, the world was principally focused on networks being a big dumb pipe, okay? Let's make the network fast, cheap, reliable, and ignore it. And then does anybody know what happened around 2002 that changed that? Uh, something called Code Red, NIMDA, a uh, number of denial of service attacks and viruses occurred it's the first time. Uh, you know, most of you probably have, uh, if you're younger, you've kind of lived in a world where cybersecurity is the reality. If you go back into the 90s, people didn't even think about it. And when networks started to become attacked, we started to think about how we would defend them. And one of the things that we realized is that most networks had no idea who was on them. And so we came to this conclusion that contextual networking, this idea of knowing who you are or where you are, would be very useful in being able to define network behavior. And so .1x was the, uh, the result of bringing that technology into, for identity management and policy into the LAN environment. And uh, interestingly enough, at the same time, I started doing a lot of patent work around location services. So I have patents that go back to, let's call it the late 1990s, around location-based data, location-based services. Uh, the funny thing about that is, you know, you get to watch your kid grow up a little bit. The crazy idea about knowing where people are in the network seemed a little nutty back in 1999, 2000. Today, the idea of knowing where you are, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, is a pretty foundational piece of internet architecture. And so it's a matter of deciding that the world is going to need something interesting, innovating in a creative way, and coming up with a solution. So that was uh, Enterosys. Interestingly enough, at Enterosys, I also, uh, in addition to being the, uh, the chief technology officer over the course of my career there, uh, it was about a billion dollar company, I became the, uh, the chief marketing officer a few times, usually because my boss, uh, the CEO, fired the chief marketing officer and handed it to me. <laughs> Happened five times. The fifth time, I didn't give marketing back. I basically said, uh, enough's enough. I keep fixing it and you keep breaking it, so I'm going to just hold on to it. And what I realized is that marketing and technology have a lot to do with each other. Uh, if you build great technology and you're not able to position it effectively, then it's an interesting technical exercise, but you probably will never gain market acceptance. And so uh, I actually enjoyed being the CMO for a little while. I don't know if I'd want to do that full time, but uh, uh, it was an interesting combination. Ironically, at the same time, I also became the chief information officer, which was quite fun to run a, you know, a, the IT organization of a billion dollar company uh, while I was building the technology we were developing and marketing it. But, uh, but interestingly enough, it gave me an interesting context about the customer pain points and the idea that great technology that sounds great on paper is even marketed fantastically and comes from fantastic innovation, if handed to a customer that is unwilling or unable to use it, it is useless. And in the enterprise space, what you know, probably the most interesting conversation I had with a, a CIO was with a, one of the former CIOs of uh, one of the large investment banks in, in, uh, in New York. We were at a technology summit, and he asked, uh, we were, somebody asked him, what do you think of storage over IP? You know, instead of having these dedicated storage area networks, why don't we uh, you know, just put it all over an IP interface and put it over the internet or put it over some kind of routing infrastructure? And his comment, which was really telling about enterprise CIO's mindset, is he said, uh, here's how I think about new technology. There are only two possible outcomes of adopting it. One is that it works just fine, drives the cost down, and everything keeps working. And the other is, it breaks, shuts down the trading floor, and I'm the former CIO, okay? I think that's important, because what it tells you is, great technology, great innovation, without the context of the end customer, is essentially 
uh, only part of the solution. You have to understand the customer's pain points. You have to realize that the customer fundamentally may not be willing or able to adopt your disruptive technology, no matter how exciting and thrilling it is. Um, anyway, that was kind of a fun period of my life. And then uh, ultimately, I took Interesis private. It became a privately held company by Gores and Tannenbaum, and then was rolled into Siemens Enterprise Networks. And then uh, that was the time that I decided, after I took it private, I, I told them I'd leave after it was done, because I'd been there for a long time. I wanted to do something different. Actually, I wanted to go back and do a PhD in cultural anthropology focused on, uh, I, I kid you not, actually. I, I, I really wanted to study the use of technology by, he, by people, because <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, um, a former supplier of mine, uh, led by a gentleman named Henry Samueli, a company called Broadcom Corporation, uh, decided that they, they thought it would be better for me to, instead of going and doing a PhD in cultural anthropology, that I should move to Long Beach, California and work for Henry and be a CTO for networking technologies there. And Henry convinced me, as a former faculty member at UCLA, that uh, it would be uh, just as exciting and equally fulfilling. And so I moved to California for the first time and uh, became CTO for networking technologies there. That was my most relaxed period in life. I, lived on the beach in Long Beach. I worked for a billionaire who owned a hockey team. I play hockey, by the way. Um, I, I had projects that were three years in duration, and I worked for one of the most successful companies in the semiconductor industry. Um, exciting, and then one day a friend of mine, a guy named George Riedel, uh, who was the uh, chief strategy officer of Juniper Networks and formerly ran McKinsey in Australia and a few other places, uh, called me up and said, hey, I have a really interesting job for you. I've just joined a company called Nortel. And uh, they're kind of broken, and we're trying to fix it. How'd you like to, to come be the CTO? I said, Nortel, aren't they dead yet? I, I thought they were gone. And uh, so he convinced me after many calls and convinced me to fly up to Ottawa, Canada, and Toronto and talk to the CEO, a guy named Mike Zafiroski, who used to run uh, Motorola, a uh, piece of Motorola, and he was at G General Electric running a few different businesses there, including GE Lighting, uh, that it would be exciting to join Nortel. Uh, an $11 billion company that used to be an icon in the industry that uh, had been, uh, let's call it, on a steady decline for a number of years. So stupid me, leaving a beachfront environment, working for a billionaire-owned hockey team, I decided, nah, that's not exciting enough. I'm going to move to Ottawa, Canada, 140-degree temperature swing, by the way, second coldest capital in the world, uh, 14 feet of snow in the winter, and run a R&D organization consisting of 12,000 R&D staff, trying to turn around a company that had been wildly mismanaged for probably a decade. Uh, sounds, uh, now, right now would be the time where you're saying I should leave because this guy is obviously insane and we should not listen to him. Um, but the reason I joined was I flew up to Ottawa and in my Ottawa campus I had about 5,000 engineers. About, it was about two and a half million square feet of lab space and technology f footprint. And I met some of the most brilliant engineers I had ever worked with, people that were just uh, had done foundational work in the industry. They had developed the optical infrastructure. They had developed wireless technology. They had been foundational in almost every dimension of telecommunications and were still there for some reason. I couldn't quite understand that after all the trouble they had gone through. Um, but they were still committed to technology. And so I flew up to Ottawa, actually moved, uh, and started working at Nortel. At Nortel, I was responsible for kind of two things. One, to put them back on a track in terms of technology and R&D structure so that we could actually begin to innovate again. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and second, I was brought in because, if you couldn't tell by my personality, I'm a bit type A. And the way I put it to the board is, now you've hired me, I'm going to go pick some fights. We're going to get back in this game. We're going to make it very clear that we are a relevant player in this industry. Um, the innovation side was interesting because the first thing I did is I put together a team that would take a look objectively at our innovation. Were we truly innovating? 12,000 engineers sounds like a lot of R&D capacity. My budget at Nortel, for just my budget for R&D, was a billion seven a year. Uh, I had uh, a lot of capacity. Uh, I served carriers, enterprises, I built everything from optical to uh, next generation wireless technology to enterprise switches and routers to voice communication systems. Uh, we even did work around virtual reality and immersive environments, lots of interesting technology. Um, one of the most uh, foundational, uh, some of the most foundational technology in the industry. I can now say that definitively because uh, the story of Nortel, if you don't know how it ended, ultimately I left just before the, some people running the company made some decisions that headed off into bankruptcy with $2.7 billion in cash, um, which was a little strange. Uh, but ultimately, it got, 
It got broken up, sold off, and now pieces of it are in many other companies. But the most interesting piece was the patent portfolio that I was responsible for managing uh, was monetized and sold for $4.5 billion, which was the largest patent transaction ever in the history of everything. Um, so I truly believe that there was good innovation there, and we had a lot to do with creating it. Anyway, back to innovation. I walk into this company, and we do an objective assessment. Because it needed to be objective, because if you walk up to anybody dealing with technology or anybody dealing with a product, and you walk up and say, your product, your technology, your business is not innovative, it is akin to calling your child ugly. Okay? It doesn't usually make friends. If, on the other hand, you can objectively assess whether or not you're truly doing innovation <laughs> and that it's having an impact, then at least you have a starting point where you know where you stand. At Nortel, one of the first things we did is we assessed, uh, to be perfectly honest, where we were spending the money. Where are we spending money on late life cycle technology, innovative technology? And we needed some objective criteria to define that. And so what we looked at is we set up a very simple model that actually has worked fairly well. We said there are really three technology stages, and you need to look at them differently. There are late life cycle technology projects, which are actually defined very clearly as technology of which the market has a negative compounded annual growth rate. It's negative CAGR. It's in decline. Very simple. If you're in a negative CAGR market, you're in decline. No matter how you put it, you are in decline. You're never going to go up. Uh, net compounded annual growth rate, the market is shrinking. You are mid-life cycle if you are in a market that has a definable CAGR that is positive. Even 1% is fine. You know? we, we tried to shoot for about 5%, but as long as the market is growing, it's different than a late-life cycle product. And you are in innovation if you are in a market where fundamentally, or merging is what we called it, the market CAGR is not really calculatable. How do you calculate the market CAGR for Facebook? <laughs> kind of hard to figure out exactly. Uh, you know, and the reality is, I'm not sure they're entirely innovative in all dimensions, but they're in a space that is clearly emerging. And the first thing we did is looked at every technical project, every dollar we spent in R&D, and tried to figure out what the footprint was. Of our 100% of R&D, what was the distribution? Anybody want to guess what it was? 55% <laughs> in late life cycle. 45% in mainstream, zero on emerging technology, essentially zero, a little bit of a rounding error. Okay? That's a problem. And so we said, well, what should it be? And I remember talking to the CEO, and he said, well, we need to have a, a, you know, an approach to, OK, if we're clearly wrong, which everybody could tell, what should it be? And so I guessed. I said, I don't know, 20-60-20 sounds good. <laughs> and he said, OK, go do that. <laughs> and so off we went. And so for the next year, we began a process of essentially saying, for late life cycle technology, you shouldn't be spending 15% of your revenue on R&D. You should be spending five. You should figure out ways to cash maximize that technology, basically run it through late life cycle, preserve your market share. But the only thing you need to do is manage that curve to zero. And as long as you get your fair share, that's perfectly acceptable. You don't have to beat your competitors in late life cycle technology. You have to preserve your market share. In mainstream technology, it was more the normal R&D spend, about 15%, 15, actually about 17% at Nortel, uh, and became fairly straightforward. And for emerging technology, spend whatever you want. Okay? Most, thing, most important thing is speed, because there is no ROI. If you have no revenue on an emerging technology, you know, being frugal on your R&D spend is just delaying the time between now and when you actually get revenue. And it didn't mean they had a blank check, but it meant, meant that you didn't really worry about the financial model. You worried about the speed in which you executed. Innovation happening quickly was the key for that. And so we began a process of recalibrating within about 9 to 12 months. We were at 2060 20. We invested extremely heavily in things like common engineering, where we discovered things like we had, I think, 13 or 15 different fixed mobile convergence projects going on that didn't even talk to each other. Same product being built by different groups to solve exactly the same problem with no coordination. Clearly inefficient. We had two core router products, each of which were $100 million a year in R&D spend, roughly, <laughs> that, again, were not coordinated. It took us a little longer to get that one sorted out, but clearly that's a big waste. And at the end of it, we actually brought the R&D spend down a bit, but also got to this 2060-20 model and started to truly innovate. We started to drive the next generation of unified communications. We accelerated LTE. I can now, I'm on the record of this at Mobile World Congress in 2007 on the CTO panel, you know, a couple thousand people in the audience. 
they asked myself and Hockam Erickson from Erickson and Paul Mankiewicz and Alcatel Lucin and a bunch of us two questions. When will LTE, long-term evolution, you know what Verizon's selling now, when will that happen? And more importantly, what will be the killer app? And I won't comment on what my colleagues said, but they were wrong. Um, my answer was 2011, and the applications will be, there will be no killer app specifically, it will be everything that is interesting that you can do on the non-mobile internet will suddenly become mobilized. And I think we were right on both counts. Um, one of my competitors, name, remain nameless unless you want to go look it up on the web, said 2015 and made up some crazy application that nobody cares about. Um, bottom line though, the takeaways from that discussion though, is that fundamentally if you want to do innovation, you have to ask why. How does it fit into the grand scheme of things? I know your coursework and the work that you're doing is talking about open innovation, talking about ways to do innovation, new models, but understand innovation is not operating in a vacuum. Innovation exists at the front end of an R&D cycle. It exists as an engine that feeds a much bigger engine behind it, and that engine ultimately has to deliver real products for real revenue. And so having an innovation model that can actually feed that engine and allow you to not just create interesting technology, but ultimately make it the de facto for the mainstream market where the revenue can be collected is the mission. <laughs> and so unfortunately, sometimes we lose track of that. Uh, a lot of people think about you know, the output being a cool idea, a patent. The reality is the output is always money. <laughs> how much money can you make? How much market share can you get? How many customers can you actually touch with this technology that give you market share? So my experience with Nortel was, uh, you know, again, I, it's funny, uh, for a company that ultimately went into bankruptcy and is now kind of broken up into about seven or eight different companies and generated about $10 billion of asset value through, the, through bankruptcy sales, which is pretty good considering most of it was technology they were selling off. Um, the reality is that was probably the most interesting job I've had until the current one. <laughs> Um, so after Nortel, by the way, I, I resigned just before the bankruptcy because I didn't really agree with that. I know this is being webcast so people can quote me on that. I didn't think that was a really good idea, but you know, I, there were lots of reasons to and not to do that. Um, and then I retired, uh, kind of young to retire, but I uh, decided I think it would be kind of fun to just do some consulting and play hockey four days a week and did that for you know, about a year. And then I got bored and said, you know, consulting is fun to some extent, that you have great work-life balance and, you know, pays well and, you know, you can do all kinds of other things, but you never actually get to do the whole thing. You just tell other people what to do. You get on a board and you fly to another country and you tell a company what they're doing wrong and you point them in the right direction and then you get on a plane and then you go do that exact same thing for somebody else and you forget about the person you talked to two weeks ago. And to be perfectly honest, that's great for some people. There's a huge consulting industry. Maybe some of you are thinking about that, that path. Congratulations. Probably, we'll probably work with you at some point. We use lots of consultants. Um, for me, however, it's all about, you know, you want to create the technology. You want to actually shape the industry. And so um, after about a year, I decided, okay, well, I'd at least entertain the headhunters that were calling and trying to convince me to unretire and do something interesting. And I talked to lots of companies. I, I came to the conclusion that, it, you know, the telecom industry was somewhat of a, a dead animal. Um, it was interesting, but not really innovating. There was a lot more innovation going on outside of the telecom industry. If you want to hear my point of view on that, I gave a keynote at Interop in New York a few months ago that's on the web. You can just go Google my name, you'll see it, talking about the difference between the consumer environment and the enterprise environment. And the punchline was uh, the consumer environment is where all the action is. The enterprise environment is a market that's been growing steadily but has far fewer competitors and almost no innovation in it. Um, but the punchline, though, is that really, um, after about a year, I started to look around and say, where is the action going to be? And I've always held, probably for the last five or six years, that the industry composition of the telecommunications and the technology industry around communication, whether it be enterprise or carrier or consumer, was in a period of transition that it, it seemed illogical for us to think that there would just be carriers with carrier technology and enterprises with enterprise technology and consumers with consumer technology and they would never interact with each other. There would never be overlap between them or combinations of them. And it became abundantly obvious, and I'll talk about some examples later, that actually the most exciting stuff is when you actually put together technology from these three different ecosystems. The problem was that most of the industry is still set up to be carrier companies selling to carriers, enterprises to enterprises, consumers to consumers. You know, if we do word association, uh, you know, tell me which of the following uh, 
I'll give you a company name. You tell me carrier enterprise or consumer company in terms of what they sell. Apple. Consumer, consumer absolutely. Okay. Uh, Cisco. Enterprise. Okay. Ericsson, if you know who they are. Carrier. Okay. I mean, that's today, right now. That's what they are. Microsoft. Well, kind of somewhere in the middle, but mostly enterprise. You know, it's a little struggle on the consumer side. You know, Google. Yeah, kind of a little more complex. You know, consumer mostly, but there's some other stuff going on there. IBM. Enterprise, okay, but yet they have carrier and other stuff. So it, it, it's it's funny because interestingly enough, we'll talk about it later. Clearly, the most exciting stuff is happening when you combine technology. Yet the industry composition is still kind of broken. It's it's about five to ten years behind what the actual consumer does with technology. So along comes a company called Huawei that I had really I had known about. Uh, in fact, there I'll touch on what we do and who we are a little bit, uh, but. Uh, but Huawei is the great disruptor. It's the first globalized technology company to come out of China. And I'll give you the demographics in a bit. But um, one of the things Huawei did, uh, just after I left Nortel, I resigned and left, and I, I ran the R&D organization. About two weeks after Nortel declared bankruptcy, Huawei immediately opened an R&D center right across the street from the Ottawa campus, and then proceeded to hire the best and brightest people from Nortel, including a bunch of the Nortel fellows that we had created and distinguished members. And, and I thought that was kind of interesting. All these people had worked for me, and they started calling me up saying, there's this interesting company. And it's amazing what happened. We just kind of walked across the street, and now we're doing some interesting stuff instead of fighting with a bankruptcy. Um, more importantly, what I started to hear and what I knew was that the company was moving very fast, what seemed to be you know, unencumbered by some of the legacy of the industry. Um, so after about a year of being a consultant and hearing about it, I finally said, I'll, I'll talk to them. And so I went to Shenzhen, uh, which is where we're based, which is just about 20 miles from Hong Kong. Um, Shenzhen, for, for instance, if you're not familiar, if any of you own an Apple product, um, pretty much they're all built there. <laughs> uh, Fox, Foxconn, which you're probably familiar with by name, lots of controversy and other things, has a factory there that I think employs about 500,000 people at the campus. Okay. Uh, so it's a very large city that uh, I think 20 years ago was probably 50,000 people in small town, a very small town. Today it's 14 to 16 million people and very modern, very interesting. So I flew to Shenzhen, met with uh, the executives at Huawei and started saying, well, why on earth do you want me to join you? And the answer I got was because we have hit a point where we can no longer be the fast follower. We had spent the last 20 years out executing everybody. The industry defines a standard, and then it's a race. Whoever gets there first with the most effective, efficient technology wins. And Huawei was very good at that. The problem is, if you do that really, really well, what happens? You become the leader. Eventually, you're a number one market share. <laughs> What's the change between a fast follower and a leader? Well, you no longer get to follow anyone. There's no one to chase. More importantly, your customers expect you to be the leader. And the definition of a leader, very fundamentally, is that you innovate. You define the future. And so Huawei had come to the conclusion that now that they were becoming the leader in almost every segment they participated, they needed to focus on innovation. They needed to focus on having creative ways to deal with the innovative architectures that their customers were asking for to solve the problems that weren't defined by the standards, to influence the industry in a meaningful way. And they had made a conscious decision that the way to do that was not to just simply expand their capacity in China, we have fantastic people in China, fantastic talent pool there, but they realized that innovation comes from lots of different places. And while we have great R&D capacity, 55,000 engineers in China, the reality is the culture and the organization was set up to execute. It was not set up necessarily to be chaotic innovation. And so the conclusion was, well, if we want to do a bit of this kind of crazy innovation, we should go someplace where there's a lot of lunatics. And uh, they decided that, you know, North America would be a good place to do that. And we already had a presence, and so we decided to scale it. And Silicon Valley seemed like a good place to do that. We also have facilities in Bridgewater, New Jersey, in North Carolina, in Colorado, in San Diego, uh, in Plano, Texas. We have a facility up in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, you know, obviously, they understood that there was a different culture of innovation. You know, to quote a friend of mine from Microsoft, a guy named Jawad Kak, who used to be the group vice president for Windows Networking, you know, we understood how to fail forward faster that we could actually make mistakes, we could be perfectly comfortable falling down if we learned something, which, as you may or may not understand, in a Chinese company that is very execution-oriented, it was not a good idea to fall down too often. <laughs> because if you fell down while you were executing, you didn't actually get to the end state. 
when you fall down on innovation, you actually avoid mistakes because falling down early is a good way to avoid going down a path that's a dead end. And so there was an acknowledgement that we needed to scale it. I thought it would be interesting to come in and try to do that, and so I joined the company. So anyway, that is the longest introduction you will ever hear in a presentation. But I thought for context, it'll give you a little bit of a framing of my background and kind of how we think about innovation. You know, I know this is a discussion of open innovation, and we will get to that. In all of those companies, I have been a big believer in open innovation before Henry started uh, making sure people knew what that term was, um, mostly because... I subscribe to a philosophy that says that the most interesting technology and solutions generally do not come from one place. They do not come from one particular mind. They come from the collaboration across boundaries. If I go back into the 1990s when I was at a company called Cabletron Systems, we came up with this crazy idea called Secure Fast Virtual Networking, which was connection-oriented Ethernet. Now, if any of you are networking people, you understand that right now there's a bunch of things called Trill and, a few, and OpenFlow and a bunch of other stuff that are bringing connection-oriented Ethernet back into the industry. 1992, we built the first connection-oriented Ethernet technologies. And the reason it was an open innovation project is we knew we thought it was a good idea to have predictive Ethernet, but we didn't know how to use it. We didn't know what it would be used for. So we began deep interaction with our customers. We worked with places like the University of North Carolina, which to this day still runs a lot of that technology. We, we worked with Agilent Technologies and HP and their fiber optic plants. The North American operations for all of General Motors at that time, we were deploying this technology and this crazy, absolutely almost experimental technology. And when we got it in place and it could pass packets, then what we started to learn is what could people do with it? If you had a network that was no longer uh, unpredictable, but actually understood the concept of a flow or a session, and could make really intelligent decisions about whether or not that flow was going to happen and how it was going to be handled. There were interesting things you could solve with that, but we didn't know what they were. Funny enough, we found out around 2000 when all the viruses and worms started to hit, our customers that had adopted this technology, mostly to just gain a more deterministic network, were able to react to security threats in seconds because the network was predictable. And then we realized, wow, you know that secure, fast virtual networking, the secure thing, which we didn't really know why we called it that, actually was a really interesting characteristic of a deterministic network. You could actually make it secure. You could overcome security threats by having determinism in the infrastructure. I, to this day, will tell you that people like Jim Gogan and Mike Hawkins at UNC were collaboration partners for us. They were the ones that experimented and created these ideas, came back to us and said, what if you could do it this way? And the result was maybe 80% of it came from us, but the 20% that actually allowed us to deploy this technology on 100 million ports around the world uh, was fundamentally deep collaboration in a rather ad hoc way <laughs> to an ecosystem of customers and partners that saw that there was value, but we needed to explore how we could use the technology before we could actually come to a conclusion about how to productize it. Okay. When I was at Nortel, same thing. At Nortel, what I realized is clearly we needed to understand our distribution of R&D. I talked about that with 206020. But I also realized that even with 12,000 engineers, I didn't have enough scale to truly compete in the marketplace. Okay. And the reason for that actually was because of people like Huawei who at that time probably had 40,000 engineers, far more than I had. And in order for me to compete, I had to come up with a model in which I could get effective scale beyond my 12,000. And so we developed a model in which we started to look at the total end-to-end -end ecosystem of R&D. On one side, we had our late life, late life cycle, end-of-life people, people who like just you know, gracefully ending and cost-reducing a product. And on the other side, the very, very front of it, we had the academic community we realized that in academia, we could take significant risk. We could do crazy things and try to figure out problems well in advance of the industry. So we coordinated our activities. Nortel had always done that well, but we kind of doubled down in this space. We instituted a whole bunch of new processes and approaches about how to work better with the academic institutions around the world. Uh, we actually, interestingly enough, I even brought in uh, you know, leading academics to come and work at Nortel for you know, a year as a visiting fellow. A guy named Andy Lippman was our first visiting fellow. He was one of the people who founded the Media Lab at MIT. And the reason I brought him in was not because he had any particular skill that was necessary for a particular product. It was because he lived in a world that was all about collaborative innovation. And by putting him inside of Nortel, unfettered, he was there to shake the place up. When he started, he said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to wander around and make people very uncomfortable. 
And that's what he did. And he will tell you to this day, that's exactly what he did for us. And it was very effective because it got us thinking outside of our comfort zone. By bringing someone from the outside in and letting them run loose in our organization to get people to think differently. Beyond that, we also realized that we needed to understand how to measure and understand whether or not that academic institution funding was actually useful. And so I put a kind of arbitrary metric out there. I said, I want 50 to 1 return on investment. I want to see that if I spend a dollar funding university research, that it's the equivalent of spending $50 trying to do the same work internally. And we were actually successful in measuring that. In many cases, we were pretty close, if not at 50 to 1. And it created huge effective scale in our ability to actually understand a much broader set of problems than we could possibly do internally. Interestingly enough, in between academic research and end of life, we had a whole bunch of other things that we did. We instituted something called incubation. I convinced the CEO that said, we have a lot of bright people, but the institutions of the company prevent them from executing on their ideas. So what do they do? They leave. They go start a startup. They do something outside. And so we took about 5% of the R&D budget and created a incubator, a startup incubator within the company. Funny enough, from that, we actually were undersubscribed. It's an interesting thing. You know, I got 70 million bucks sitting there, and uh, you know, basically uh, I couldn't get enough ideas. And I'll to tell you why. Number one, people who work inside of big companies, even if they are innovative, get comfortable with a consistent paycheck. And the idea of jumping into an incubation project, which is treated like a startup, if it fails, there's no guarantee you have a job, <laughs> was actually a huge disincentive. But it also acted as a great culling mechanism because the people who actually jumped into those projects <coughs> truly were burning the boats. They did not care about going back to what they were doing before. They really wanted to execute. The result of that, interestingly enough, is there's actually probably the most successful project that we got out of that was something called Web.Alive, which is now part of Avaya. If you go onto Lenovo.com, they have a virtual, uh, fully immersive 3D environment, kind of second life for the enterprise, if you will, used for commercial purposes. We used spatial audio, we used the epic gaming engine underneath it, a lot of really cool stuff to create that environment that would actually work in the enterprise. Second Life doesn't work for enterprise. It doesn't have the right security model, it doesn't have the right trust model, it's not really immersive enough. We realized, uh, if you, you can go read my, my blogs on this, one of the things we did is, once we built this engine, one of the first experiments I told the team is I said, I want to do our next, what's called global information session in the virtual environment in mixed reality. Meaning I want to be an avatar inside, and I want people to be inside, and I want people to be in conference rooms interacting with a virtual environment. And I gave them a deadline of being able to do this, and within, I think it was about nine months, we got the system up and running, and we did the first GIS, and we had, I think, 5,000 people involved in this. It was kind of interesting. What we learned by exposing that technology that way was all the things that don't work. Imagine you're an avatar, and you're using wideband spatial audio, so it's pretty cool. I mean, if you walk up to my avatar, the voice sounds closer. If you take, go off to a corner, you can have a private conversation. You can do all kinds of interesting things. Except as the presenter, imagine that we're sitting here, and you're all avatars, sitting at computers, and I'm the presenter looking at your avatars. How do I get feedback from you? How do I know that you get what I'm saying? In this room, I can see you either falling asleep, or you're smiling, or laughing, or pointing, or doing something. But in the virtual world, very little about that. You know, people have really primitive engines like clapping engines and hand raisers, and those are not sufficient. So as soon as we did it once and put 1,000 people in, in the virtual environment and about 4,000 in the mixed reality environment, we learned what the problems were. And again, it wasn't because some engineer had a bright idea. It was because we actually put the technology to practice. We exposed it to our customers early. The result from that is that we realized that you could actually get biofeedback from the person who was engaged. If you're typing on your keyboard, if you're multitasking, what you could do in the virtual environment is create a halo around the user, a, col a colored halo. If it's green, people are paying attention. If it starts to get yellow, they're not paying attention. If it's red, they've walked away from their computer. They're not even there anymore. And then you start to see, imagine, a thousand avatars <laughs> that you can kind of tell the general tone of the environment. But it's a radically different way to think about biofeedback in a virtual environment you would never have, it sounds completely obvious, but it would have been very difficult to figure that out without actually putting into practice in a real environment at scale. Uh, in any event, the incubator was the second level. And we basically realized that fundamentally incubation is necessary in large organizations because some of the brightest ideas 
need to be protected from the DNA of the company before they actually get killed. One of the most interesting technologies, we, we bought a small company called Diamondware that did spatial audio. Spatial audio is very cool technology. Centrally mixed, all software, soft ESPs. Uh, it's actually used by the special forces, was used by a bunch of gaming engines. The reality though is, as soon as we bought that technology, the voice people in Nortel, and it's a voice company, their antibodies came out. This is not good, we can do this ourselves, we already have systems to do this. And so the only way that it would have survived Instead of putting it into that business that was building traditional voice systems, we had to keep it out of there and incubate it. Let it get success by itself without these other people who can absolutely build this technology but have not, <laughs> destroying it before it becomes a threat. And the idea is I would rather cannibalize my own market than be cannibalized by an interesting startup that I'm not able to react to. Third level, so academic, incubation, third level, was I created something that, having never met Henry and never really heard the term other than in literature, and I think it was right around the time that some of his books were kind of getting some, some track record, is I created something called the Open Innovation Lab, or OIL. And it was just because we wanted a cool acronym, and we wanted it to visualize what we were trying to do. We were trying to lubricate the innovation engine. The Open Innovation Lab was very simply put a group of about 50 people, all technical, kind of hackers, if you will, that people with very deep technical expertise that like to build things. And what we used it for is we turned them towards our customers. We essentially said, fundamentally, these people are to find customers that have an unmet need. And their job is to go meet with those customers, figure out what that unmet need is, go back to their lab, and very quickly develop a working prototype. And then go back to the customer and say, are we close? And if not, iterate it. And if we're heading in the right direction, keep iterating it. And when we get to the point that the customer says, I like it, then transfer it to the technology groups and let them build the product. We were very successful with that model. That very small team went into places like uh, some of the banks in Asia. I remember going into one deal where two of our competitors were in there and the customer wanted a virtual kiosk. They wanted an eight, you know, basically this idea of walking up to what effectively looks like an ATM machine but using video conferencing, document scanning, a bunch of other things, could interact with a teller somewhere in the infrastructure of that bank. So it's like going to a branch, but you're talking to a machine. And you know, it made a lot of sense. There's some people that are now doing this. Remember, this is 2006 that we're talking about. We weren't invited to that bid because we didn't have an offering. Two of our competitors were. They delivered what they tried to deliver, wasn't sufficient. The customer knew it wasn't what they wanted, but they kind of felt like, well, nobody's given us a good solution. I guess we'll settle for one of these. Sales team was aggressive, said, could we come in one last time? We sent in this open innovation group. All they did was listen. They said, well, what do you really want? And then they came back and they hacked together a system that actually did what was interesting. They went back, showed it to the customer. The customer said, yeah, if you can build that, <laughs> then I'll talk to you. And so because they're hackers, they basically did it in about two weeks, came back with about an 80% prototype, and the customer said, yeah, I think we're going to reopen this RFP and we're going to let you compete. We ended up winning that deal and ultimately it generated millions of dollars in revenue and you know, goodwill for everybody. Another example is we started talking to customers, some of the carriers, and they said, you know, our customers really don't like the voice experience. And they didn't know what the solution was, but they knew that there was a problem. And the problem was, this was at the time that visual voicemail was coming out, and there were, you know, this idea of mobile devices with more robust audio capability. So they don't like this idea that when you make a phone call to somebody, there are only two possible outcomes, or maybe three. Um, one is they pick up the phone and you talk to them. The other is they're not there, and what happens? It goes to voicemail, right? The third is they hang up on you, but that one we didn't cover. Um, and they said, there, there seems to be something wrong here. The customers are telling us that, you know, the reality is they're still trying to talk to that person, but they, they don't know how to make sure the connection occurs. That's all the customer said. And so off this team went and they said, well, how could we deal with this in a more interesting way? And they came up with a technology called Rendezvous. Rendezvous basically said, well, what if <laughs> when you make that phone call, when it goes to voicemail, instead of going to voicemail, it gives you two choices. One, leave them a voicemail. The other is activate a rendezvous. And a rendezvous is basically telling the system to start to invoke presence monitoring and to make sure that it knows you still want to communicate with them, but something has prevented that from happening. Maybe you're on an airplane, you're not on the network right now, but the system keeps watching for the next opportunity when all the parties are available. And when those parties show up, when you get off the plane and turn your Blackberry or iPhone or your smartphone on, 
and the system detects your presence on the network and detects that the person calling you is on the network, that it invokes that call again, your phone rings, their phone rings, tells you the rendezvous has been completed and you continue the conversation. Completely obvious, but not obvious to the people building cellular networks or communication technology. It was only obvious in the presence of a customer and environment that had actually looked at this environment and said, there's a problem with something as basic as making a phone call. It's insufficient. But also having the ability to then go back and rapidly prototype that, because we went through many iterations to get to that point, and ultimately concluding with a solution that worked, a solution that could be productized very quickly, and then could be brought into the market. You know, so. And then beyond there, obviously, we had the 2060-20 R&D side. My point behind that is innovation at a place like Nortel is far more complex than innovation in a small startup. Innovation happens at all of those levels. You use different tools and different systems with different ROI and different scaling factors. But the goal is still to make sure that you can lead in the industry by coming up with the right solution at the right time, but also that you can manage your products through its complete life cycle and that you're actually able to fully participate in the emerging, the middle, <laughs> mainstream, and the late life cycle of your industry. So anyway, uh, enough for my long-winded introduction. Uh, end of part one. So. Onto the slides. So Huawei. Um, first of all, there is a test. Huawei is pronounced Huawei, not Hawaii or anything else. I spend a lot of time. We're a Chinese company with a name that isn't easily pronounced unless you hear it. Uh, so we are steadily, person by person, convincing and telling people how to pronounce our name, which we like very much. So Huawei. Um, Huawei is a company that, uh, to quote my friend Larry O'Brien, who was the mayor of Ottawa, who opened our R&D center, his comment was, Huawei is the largest company I have never heard of. Uh, and in the West, that's very true. If you go to China, a very different discussion. Huawei is the really, probably the first big success story. Huawei was founded by Mr. Ren, who basically t over 20 years ago, when the Cold War ended, <laughs> the Chinese military decided it didn't need an engineering corps, and he basically got outsourced or downsized out of the military. Wondering what to do, he's looking around, and he figures out that the telecom industry is kind of underserving China, and he begins reselling PBXs in rural China. Two years after he gets done with that, or he starts doing that, the company he was reselling decides, oh, well, you're so successful with this, I don't actually want you to resell my stuff anymore. I'm going to kind of go around you. So he says, well, wait a minute, maybe I can build my own. And off he goes to build PBXs for rural China. So he hires some people, found the company with 5,000 US dollars and five people, okay, about 20 years ago. Uh, some of the inventions of early Huawei PBX were rat-proof PBXs. Okay? <laughs> Why? Because you're in rural China. Things, you know, if you're familiar with Grace Hopper, you know, the term bug <laughs> is not talking about software coding. It's talking about real bugs in systems that cause problems. Uh, so the reality of it is, is, you know, we started with this fairly moder moderate approach to the industry, selling PBXs in rural China, developing our own PBXs, and then began the progression, serving the underserved markets. We have a philosophy called outside in which basically says start at the outside and then work towards the more complex environments. It's a little different than the open innovation outside in model. It's not about where you, who you talk to, it's about which market you start with. Do you start with the big core cities or do you go after the underserved rural population and innovate there? If you win there, interesting enough, there's a lot more people. And it's actually a lot easier to then get to the cities when you're surrounded them is a good way to describe it. We have done the same thing in Europe. We entered Europe in Eastern Europe. We focused on the underserved markets. We focused on the developing markets. And the result was building up huge market share, critical mass, and markets that other people wouldn't even touch. In fact, uh, many people attribute the fact that there is a massive expansion of mobile connectivity in the world to Huawei because we were the only ones that would actually go and try to drive the cost of GSM down to a point where it was affordable in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Today, it was actually a very funny story. I was at MIT at the Media Lab at the sponsors meeting. We're standing in the elevator. And again, not many people in the West know Huawei well. And a guy across from me sees my badge and sees Huawei and says, oh, I love you guys. Takes out a Huawei phone and says, yeah, I just got back from, uh, was it Kenya? And there, these things are all over the place. You guys are just the dominant player because that was a market that we knew that we could actually, quite frankly, serve well. But we had to serve it with a different economic threshold, a different approach to how we approach that market. Um, in any event, 
Today, Huawei is last year, well, I can't tell you last year's numbers because we haven't released them yet, but needless to say, uh, in 2010, we were 28.1 billion in global sales, 36 billion in bookings. Uh, last year, we were bigger. Uh, if you go Google us today for news in the last like two days, the speculation is as of this year, we'll be the largest telecommunications equipment supplier in the world, bigger than Ericsson. Okay? And we started with a guy selling PBXs in rural China okay, 20 years ago. Company has actually, I think today, about 135,000 employees around the world. We are in 140 countries. Uh, we have R&D centers across the world. Our primary customers are 45 of the top 50 telecom operators, uh, but we sell to a lot more than that. Okay. We are also arguably the first globalized Chinese company. Today, only about 30% of our revenue comes from China. The rest is international. And we are present in almost every market in the world. The one market where we are not a dominant player today is the United States. And I was uh, over in uh, Hong Kong at Asia D, Walt Mosberg's conference, kind of like all things D, but the Asia version of it. And uh, they were interviewing me and asked, how do you think about the US? And I said, well, we think about it differently than everybody else. To us, the United States is an emerging market. <laughs> and I'm probably the only person in the world that can actually say that. Everybody else, the US is the dominant market and everything else is emerging. We're kind of counter-cyclical, is a good way to describe it. From a revenue perspective, and not to bore you with the details, but, um, and we'll get to this in a second. Huawei obviously is 28, 30 billion dollars in sales, growing very fast, but underneath that, what we started to realize is that whether we planned it or not, it wasn't sufficient to just sell telecom gear to telecom operators. When you talk to a telecom operator, they start to ask questions like, well, what do I put in the hands of the consumer? You can build the wireless network, but what about the end node? Should you build that too? What about the enterprise environment? Maybe you should build some of the gear there because enterprises and carriers aren't that different. In fact, they connect through something called the internet. <laughs> and so over the last several years, the company has actually evolved. And the bottom shows you our trend line for our enterprise business, which only formally became an existing entity in March of last year. But before that, without planning it, we inadvertently started to generate billions of dollars in enterprise revenue because there were adjacencies or overlaps between the carrier and enterprise world. We didn't plan for it. It was just what would happen is a large petrochemical company would come to us and say, we know you're a carrier company, but we're trying to build a network that's going to have a million things on it. And the enterprise people can't build to that scale. Could you help us with that? And we started to say, sure, we'll sell you gear. And then they said, but we'd like some enterprise specific stuff. Well, it's just R&D. And the result was we started to sell enterprise solutions. Didn't really consider it as a strategy, but the reality is it happened. And by 2009, we were doing about a billion dollars in enterprise sales. Uh, last year, actually 2010, we were two billion. Last year, we formally created the enterprise business. So we actually had a real business as opposed to just this ad hoc stuff. And we estimate that we'll do about four billion. This year, our goal is about almost seven billion, which will make us the second largest enterprise player in the world. And our goal by 2015 is 15 billion in sales. Okay? So big is a good way to describe Huawei. So enough about us. So what was the thing that we were playing against or the view of the industry that we needed to navigate? And that view is, uh, very simply put, something called ICT. ICT is this concept that the carrier enterprise and consumer markets are starting to blur, or they already have blurred. And the reality is we no longer are logically able to describe a carrier world with carrier vendors and carrier technology, enterprise with enterprise vendors, enterprise technology, consumer world with consumer technology, even though the industry is still set up that way, we as human beings no longer interact at that level. In fact, it's actually very difficult for us to describe anything we do as just carrier, just enterprise, or just consumer. So about a year and a half ago, we realized that this was an inevitability, that there was no path in the future in which the markets would diverge that you would start to have pure carrier, pure enterprise, and pure consumer like you had 10 years ago. And if that was an inevitability, we ought to react to it. And so about 15 months ago, Mr. Wren, I was telling Henry over lunch, it was kind of an interesting trigger point, stood up and said in a speech that no one knew was coming, <laughs> was not a consensus, we need to transform from being a carrier company to being an ICT company. 
and we need to do it quickly for two reasons. One, the current industry that we're in, the carrier business, we're going to run out of oxygen. The whole business is only like $200 billion in addressable market. Even though the internet is getting bigger, the price to build the internet is going down. And so it's kind of a lot of diminishing returns here. So our goal is to be a $100 billion company. We're not going to get 50% market share of an entire industry. That's really hard to do. A lot of large numbers kick in. So we needed to expand our total addressable market. And obviously, shifting to ICT means we now have a $3 trillion market to go after. Good idea. The second reason why we did it is that, quite frankly, to remain relevant, you have to be an ICT player. If all you sell is a bunch of carrier widgets or enterprise widgets, most of your customers don't care. They aren't interested. They want you to build something that's actually useful to them. And most useful solutions draw from all three domains. Okay? So we began that transformation. Interestingly enough, 130,000 people in the company started 14 months ago. Today, we're basically done. Uh, talk about a big jigsaw puzzle. We went from business groups or business units, which were product lines, to full business groups. We completely restructured the company. When we announced the enterprise business, for instance, I did the introduction in March of last year. And I kind of gave the basic introduction and said, we're going to move 10,000 people into it very quickly. We did. Uh, in the carrier business, same thing. The consumer business, same thing. And we even have something called the other business unit, which covers energy and other things in it. Um, but all of this was done in about, about a year. Um, not simple, not painless by any stretch of the imagination, but necessary. Why is that important when you think about innovation, when you think about open innovation? Well, if your entire corporate structure changes, you have to rethink, potentially, how you did innovation in the past and what you're going to do in the future. For instance, in the carrier world, does anybody know how innovation happens? Pretty simple. There's a standard that a bunch of industry people get together and define, and then everybody builds the same stuff. Okay, with a little bit of innovation to maybe differentiate. In fact, does anybody know what standard describes uh, the cellular networks that you use today? What the standard body is? You ever hear of it? Um, the CDSMA. Well, those are the, that's the technology. There's several technologies, CDMA, UMTS, LTE. But the actual standards body, and I'm pretty sure none of you have ever heard of this, but it is the one that defined all of that stuff, is called the Third Generation Partnership Program, or 3GPP. <laughs> it's completely irrelevant to any consumer. You will never see that word in most cases. But literally, a bunch of industry people got together, technical people, and defined a standard in advance of the technology. And until the standard was actually codified, standardized, and rock solid, no one built any networks or technology. Okay. Does that sound like the ecosystem you're used to? <laughs> is that a good way to do innovation? How long do you think it takes to do innovation that way? Let's, uh, let's make it multiple choice. Days, months, years, decades? <laughs> Somewhere between years and decades. In fact, uh, technologies like LTE, the first time I started working on LTE, which is the new technology that you know, Verizon is deploying right now and starting to roll out with AT&T and others, uh, I think the first time we started working on it was probably 2004. Okay, Started to ship in 2011. First time I actually had a live system running was probably 2008. Okay, So it took four years just to get the first packet to burp over the air. <laughs> and then another you know, roughly three to four years before it became commercially viable. Imagine if the next iPhone came out eight years from now. <laughs> Would that be exciting to you? So <laughs> probably not. Um, my point behind that is, if you were principally in the carrier world, and then all of a sudden your CEO decides you're going to be an ICT company, the implication is not that you just get a $3 trillion market to go after. <laughs> it's not that you get to build cool stuff and have more customers and you can do you know, hire interesting people. It profoundly changes the way you have to think about things like innovation. You cannot innovate in the enterprise or consumer or even the ICT world the way you innovated as a carrier. And fundamentally, in the Huawei world, we had to transform. In fact, this presentation that I'm going through, the first time I gave a similar presentation to this was a year ago at our annual global technical conference in Shenzhen. I was the opening keynote, and the point of the presentation why I was doing it was to shake up the people in the room and to get them to start to think that the world was going to change. And they had to start to think differently. And so we'll go through the rest of it to give you a little bit of a feeling of how that world is changing. So 
ICT, I'm sure you're probably going, yeah, it sounds interesting, but I have no idea what this guy's talking about. What is an ICT solution? He makes a case that it might be exciting, but how can I put that into the reality of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? So let's do a little bit of a, a quiz. How many of you have a smartphone, an iPhone, or a tablet? Raise your hand. Keep it up if you have it, okay? How many of you are using that smartphone, Android device, tablet on a cellular network, a mobile network? Keep your hands up. How many of you are running both consumer kind of entertainment things like you know Facebook or gaming systems and doing something related to either your work or in this case let's assume your studies are your work like email okay of course you are all of you are now proudly inducted into the ICT world and the reason you're there is let's decompose this where did the device come from what kind of company built your device carrier enterprise or consumer Consumer, absolutely. All the c cool innovation around devices comes from consumer. Very little. I mean, there's one of my big competitors in the enterprise side builds a tablet. It's ridiculous. It's, uh, it, their volume is measured in tens of thousands of units, I think, and ours are measured in millions of units because consumer is where the action is. That's the volume. That's where you get rapid innovation in devices. The network you're using is what? Carrier, enterprise, or consumer? It's carrier, absolutely. You know, none of you can build a cellular network in your backyard. It, you know, kind of, kind of expensive to do that. You probably could. It'd be kind of awful to do, but <laughs> the FCC would come see you, and all kinds of bad things would happen. Um, and then lastly, the applications. If you're using something like, oh, I don't know, an email system that allows you to get email from Berkeley, <laughs> where'd that come from? It was an enterprise application. So in that very simple example of having a cool mobile device that can be accessible anywhere and can do both entertainment and productive business work, you are an example of an ICT solution. You are fundamentally part of that kind of new world. Actually, let me jump back. So interestingly enough, and I'll get to a couple other examples in a second here, hopefully that crystallizes to you what it means to be an ICT solution and now start to think about all of the other examples of technology that you use, of experiences that you have, that are actually the composite of technology from different ecosystems. And we'll get into kind of how you have to navigate that. More importantly, if this occurs, <laughs> if we actually see the shift to ICT, which in fact has already happened, what we start to see is that there are fundamental shifts in terms of the industry composition, the way we think about solutions, the way we think about economics. The first, obviously, is in the ICT era, the markets no longer make sense. You can't be a carrier, enterprise, or consumer thing. You can be an ICT company. You have to ignore the fact that you know, terminals are someone else's problem, or as a consumer company, that you should not touch business applications. Apple does not think of itself as a consumer company anymore. They think of themselves as an ICT company because, quite frankly, they will go to wherever the best value is created in terms of delivering an interesting solution. iCloud is not purely a consumer experience. In fact, it's something that actually impacts the carrier environment. Uh, let me, you know, how many of you are familiar with Siri? Okay. What do you think the purpose of Siri is? Is it just voice recognition on an iPhone? No. Siri, go ahead. It is, it makes you more productive, but what do you think the actual real diabolical scheme underneath it is? Yeah. Take search away from Google. Bingo, disintermediation of search. Basically says search is the most valuable asset of the internet. It's how you can monetize the internet. And right now you experience search by reaching out and touching a website or an interface provided by the search provider. How many of you have used Siri? Does it come back and say, powered by Google? No. <laughs> You say, Siri, what's the weather like in Berkeley? And it says, the weather in Berkeley is this. Do you have any idea who actually answered that question for you? No, you don't care. Occasionally, you get a web page back, and then you know. But mostly, you're interacting with an interface that's more natural and understanding, and the net result is disintermediation of search. If you look at something like iMessage, you ever notice the green and blue blobs on your iPhone? You know what the difference is? One of them disintermediated SMS. If it's a blue blob, you're not going through the carrier's network, you're going through iCloud. If it's a green blob, you're paying the carrier. Okay? Do you care? Not at all. Two iPhones talking to each other, the message gets accomplished. You don't notice the difference. My point, though, is when we start seeing this market consolidation, you can't really tell who's doing what, because fundamentally the technology is all about the outcome, not about the ecosystem that you're a part of based on history. 
Okay? Second thing that happens is you start to see what I call the rise of vertical giants. This idea that these are really hard problems to solve. Somebody asked me once, you know, what's the worst place to be in the next five years in terms of working for a company? And my answer was a mid-size, single technology company in one ecosystem. And the reason for that is, in the future, the hard problems require a lot of different technologies to come to together and a lot of integration capability. There's definitely a place for big, vertically integrated companies, and we'll talk about that in a second. But there's also a place for startups and people who can augment those ecosystems. So imagine large planets with lots of constellations around them, but small planets, not so good. How do you like to be the carrier equipment supplier that only sells optical gear in the era of ICT? You have a very limited opportunity. Doesn't mean you're irrelevant, but you're gonna struggle compared to people who can do a lot more or people who are far more specialized. And then lastly, clearly we're gonna see technology simplification. We're gonna see changes in how we think about technology how that technology is utilized because there's an economic problem here. You know, when you start to scale to the internet, when you start to think beyond these boundaries, the cost of building these technologies or implementing them cannot be achieved if you stick with the way that the carrier world, for instance, developed technology, taking 10 years to develop one piece of technology. Okay? So, some examples of ICT just to put it home. Obviously, we talked about you know, the iPhone or the iPad with corporate email on a mobile network. That's a great ICT example. There are others. In China, we did a survey and we asked affluent Chinese households what the most interesting and useful and desirable technology they would want from someone like Huawei or the industry. You know what the answer was? High definition home telepresence. Blew me away. I was like, wow, that's interesting. Turns out, well, in China and many parts of the world, including the U.S. to some extent, family is very important. And you would like to interact with your family, and especially grandparents and grandchildren tend to like to see each other. And if they're not actually in the same house or the same city, the idea of being able to interact in a rich way is very important. What's interesting is, where did telepresence come from? It's an enterprise thing. We've been selling it for you know, $300,000 a room, and it's this big heavyweight thing. And then people started to think, wait a minute, what if we could... I don't know, make that flat panel TV with a high definition camera and some kind of infrastructure in the middle act as a video conferencing platform that was richer than just a webcam. And so we started to see early examples of that. It's a great example of ICT. The base platform, telepresence, is clearly enterprise. The experience is 100% consumer, the idea of applying it to talk to your family. And the transmission network that's going to make it all possible is absolutely the carrier world. Okay? And then the third example is, does anybody know what creative and graphic adjectives or verbs would be used to describe Skype by most carriers five years ago? Did they like it or not like it? Hated it. Absolutely hated it. And the reason they hated it is imagine you download this app that allows you to go over the top for the most profitable piece of revenue voice in your network. And so carriers did everything in their power. Remember the days where some of the carriers were going to throttle it or block it, and then we had all these congressional investigations, and people were stopped from doing it? Well, the reality is things have changed. And the reason they changed is that people started to realize that you know, Skype is neither a consumer or an enterprise thing. It's just a technology. And as a carrier, you can actually think differently about this technology and use it for good as opposed to evil, if you will. And so today, you download a Skype app on a Verizon phone. Many times it just comes with a Skype app. And the reason for it is they realized, well, if you're not on my network <laughs> and you're roaming and you have a Wi-Fi hotspot, if you use Skype, it doesn't cost me anything, me as the carrier. It goes over the top. To give you an idea, some of the carriers, you know, I can't give you real data from real customers because that would be confidential, but there are situations where some carriers that do not have footprint in other regions or technologies might be spending $500 million to a $1 billion outlay to other carriers for roaming charges and roaming services. And this idea of saying, well, while you're on my network, you use my voice minutes and my voice, net, my voice system, you go international, instead of using somebody else's network, jump onto Wi-Fi and use Skype and I'll enable that. And it prevents me from having to have any interaction with it. It keeps my profitable business whole, but allows you to solve a problem that you really want to solve, meaning be able to communicate wherever you are. 
again, an ICT experience because Skype is definitely a consumer technology. The application of it clearly is, in this case, a carrier application trying to solve a problem. And in many cases, it links into the enterprise environment because most enterprise PBXs and most enterprise environments today have the accommodation to support over-the-top voice over IP solutions. Anyway, the point behind this is there are many more. And you should start to think about that. But the takeaway is you can't build these technologies by yourself in a vacuum. You have to build them by thinking a much, a much broader footprint than what you historically have. Okay. So speeding along, this is the boring part. Um, in any event, back to those three examples or those three things that are going to happen. First, the vertical ecosystem is clearly going to happen. This is what somebody like Huawei looks like. And it should probably scare you a little bit. But what it means is if you really want to deliver an ICT solution as the sole supplier, you have to do everything from the access network to the core transfer to the data center to the content management and storage to the servers and middleware all the way to the applications. There are very few companies that can do this, but there are many that are emerging. If you look and look at companies like IBM, HP, Huawei, even Cisco to some extent. If you look at Google, what is Google's aspiration? It's not to be a search company. They're branching off into all kinds of areas because they're realizing that if you have a big footprint in the ICT era, you can actually solve those kind of problems we just described as part of your ecosystem or your environment as opposed to just depending on customer-based innovation, okay? purely for the assembly of it. And then the third piece, which again, I don't want to bore you with the details, but this is very important to us, and it basically says, if you want to participate in the ICT environment, you have to realize that the economic equation really stinks in the 2000s, 2000s, or 2100s, if you will. So the reason it stinks is because of this chart basically says that the bandwidth consumption and traffic levels are growing almost exponentially. The ARPU, or average revenue per user to a carrier, is actually flat to almost down. It's not good. And the cost to build the network as we move into these high capacity infrastructures is going up. Does anybody know what the effective improvement in cost per bit has been over the last 20 years in the internet? Okay. Roughly. I did the calculation a while back, probably a couple of years ago, 22 million to one. One bit of data 20 years ago was one twenty-two millionth <laughs> of what the cost is today. And the, you can do the data, you know, look at a 300 baud modem in the uh, uh, SNA environment to a 10 gig NIC today. And if you do the math, it's about 22 million to one. It's a massive improvement in terms of cost structure, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> the bandwidth consumption has gone up much faster than that. And so we have basically this huge problem to solve for. And the only way to solve for it is we have to really think creatively about how we build our systems. To solve for B, which is bandwidth consumption, we have to focus on delayering or simplification. To solve for C, which is cost, we have to simplify the solution architecture. We have to make it more pre-integrated, a simpler environment. And to solve for A, interestingly enough, it has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with you have to own the user experience. The people who own the user experience get the money. Let me give you some examples. Again, technical. If you're an engineer, you'll appreciate this. If you aren't, you probably won't care, but it makes a point. The point is, does anybody know the difference between 3G and 4G? Besides one's faster and it's got another G in it. Okay. Yeah. Patents, well, there's lots of patents. <laughs> um, hopefully, the patent regime is a little better in 4G than it was in 3G. Uh, Qualcomm has a little less to say about it. I know I just saw their cafeteria that was paid for by your cell phone. Anyway, um, in any event, the big difference between it is something called delayering. That the 3G environment looks like this. Uh, don't bother with the acronyms, but it's an incredibly complex environment. It emulates circuit switching over a cellular environment with multiple topologies, and there's multiple technologies. It's, it's very, very complex. It's not the mobilized internet. <laughs> it's a very distinct type of network. However, if you look at LTE, LTE looks like this. 4G LTE is a radically simplified environment. It is a flat topology. It is internet-based. There is no voice service on top of it that's circuit switched. We stripped out everything that was unnecessary. When you innovate, one of the hardest things to do is to avoid incrementalization. Okay? And I will tell you from 20 years' experience, this is by far the hardest problem. It is so easy to add a feature to any product it is next to impossible to take the feature away. 
But what I will tell you is the only reason that we will see an order of magnitude improvement in cost per bit in 4G is because we delayered it. We took all kinds of things out. We made a radically simplified infrastructure for cellular. It has no voice overlay. It has no TDM service. It is the internet in the air, <laughs> as opposed to what the cellular environment was. And the result has been, because of that delayering, about a 3x improvement in cost per bit. And the other 3x improvement is because of things called uh, well, the encoding mechanisms like OFDM and MIMO technology, which give us greater spectral efficiency, about 2.5 to 3 bits per hertz. Okay? Last year, yeah. it's delivering all these <laughs> benefits and costs. Because if you actually, very interesting, it's a great question. If you look at the LTE architecture, the decision to radically simplify it was not in the original discussion. The original discussion was to enhance the UMTS architecture to make it faster, make it more effective, and then we started down a path of trying to figure out how to do that. As we progressed, we realized we would not get there by simply adding to the UMTS architecture. Uh, by the way, if you're not familiar, uh, I'll bore you with acronyms. Today, in what's called GSM or UMTS technology, there are about five intermediary steps to make it faster. <laughs> you start with GSM, then there's uh, GPRS and Edge, and then you get into UMTS, which is the first 3G environment. These are all different technologies, incrementalization. And in the UMTS era, we realized, oh, that's not fast enough. We need a data channel. So we came up with something called HSDPA, and then we, which stands for the download channel. <laughs> so let's make a big download pipe in parallel to the main pipe that everybody will share. And then we said, well, if we can do a download, let's add HSUPA. Let's make an upload pipe, incrementalization on UMTS. Oh, well, that's not enough. We have this new technology called MIMO, which will allow us to use multi and multi out antenna technology. So let's add that to HSDPA and call it HSPA and HSPA Plus. And each of these require changes in the infrastructure, new technology, and incrementalization. And what you'll find is currently the state of the art in terms of 3G is HSPA Plus. And it's on some of the AT&T and T-Mobile networks. And it's perfectly fine technology. But it was six or seven incrementalizations of the UMTS environment. All of that was happening in parallel to this radical rethinking of the UMTS environment to go to LTE. <laughs> so in any event, the, the reason for it was twofold. One, we didn't really know how to get to this point. We had to figure it out. And the second is, we incrementalized to death the technology that we were replacing. And because of that, it delayed the deployment. Okay? So lesson for you. Radical innovation, no matter how good it is, if you're competing with the status quo, this is what happened. LTE said, well, what if we do is MIMO? That's a cool new technology. What do you think the UMTS people did? Well, let's add MIMO to UMTS. It's good enough. <laughs> it didn't solve the problem. In fact, the real measurement of difference between them is today in a UMTS environment, the round trip latency is measured in hundreds of milliseconds, potentially. In the LTE environment, because it's flat, the topology is radically simplified, the round trip latency is measured in tens of milliseconds. Architecture, you can't really overcome that without really re-architecting the system. But the real reason for it was competition to preserve the status quo and literally stealing ideas from LTE to incrementalize it to make it just a little bit better to keep the new thing from happening and the fact that we really didn't know how to do this and we had to figure it out on the journey. In fact, the first real quote unquote 3.5, 3.9G, pre-4G stuff was WiMAX. And WiMAX didn't take off commercially because just the market footprint, but WiMAX and LTE are strikingly similar in terms of the radio access network. Okay? Okay. From a solution perspective, again, I won't bore you with the details, but you have to think about the end-to-end -end solution to really drive costs down. The point behind this, though, is in the enterprise world, just so you understand the economics, I have friends that are enterprise CIOs in the healthcare market. I ask them about their budget. Out of 100% of their budget, they tell me 50% of my budget is spent to pr basically keep the existing stuff running. 49% is to meet the compliance and regulatory obligations I have. And the 1% left over allows me to do about one new technology initiative a year. Okay? Now, that's in healthcare. 
that's a massive place where we all know electronic health records and mobility and e-health and all of these things are going to make huge, huge economic impact on the macroeconomic level. But you can't do it because fundamentally your existing architecture, your existing environment is so encumbered by what you already have in place and the environment that it exists in that it starves the innovation engine. So the point behind this is to recognize that if you really want to drive forward, you have to think about creative ways to try to bring that cost of the existing infrastructure and the way that it operates down. The OPEX is the key piece, the, not necessarily the cost of acquisition of the technology. You know, the acquisition of technology in those environments is like 2% of what they're spending. The rest of it is maintaining what you have. If you simplify the ability to be compliant with HIPAA, you might save that customer millions of dollars to spend on new innovation. If you don't simplify HIPAA, there will be no budget to do new innovation. And whether you're inside a company or dealing with a customer, you have to take into account the total environment. This is a reality. Do, 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 do. Again, too much detail for this group, but we'll... Uh... And then lastly, from a user experience, simple quiz. Which of those devices would you rather use? Yeah. Pretty much you'd like to use that iPhone. Why? Functionally, they're identical. In fact, you could argue that the BlackBerry is more secure, it's more reliable, works better, it's more predictable. Why do you use the one on the left? Simplicity, the user interface. There's no double clicking. There's no crazy menu structure. You point, it happens. User interface matters. HMI is incredibly important. However, one of the most interesting things that you'll discover if you go to work in a large company it's in technology that did not originate as a user experience company is that they starve this engine. At Nortel, I walked in. Nortel had a design interpretive group in the 1990s that was fantastic. In fact, a lot of those people went over to Apple and built some fantastic stuff in other parts of the ecosystem. And then they basically decided, oh, we're just selling carrier stuff. We don't need user interface. The only user interface people left were people that told what color the box would be. Okay? They had nobody. And so one of the first things I did is I went out and hired a HMI UX guy who had his own private practice out in Oregon and said, build me a UX team. And the first time I brought him in, nobody knew what to do with him. And then we followed a process, which I, has now worked twice for me. I did it at Huawei and I've done, I did it at Nortel, where I put the user experience team in place on a trust me kind of model and gave away the service. It said, you don't have to pay for it. If you're an engineering team and you want to make your UI a little better, we'll just do it for free for you. And I describe it as the drug dealer model, because <laughs> once you get them hooked, they never give it back. At Huawei right now, I did the same thing. I hired a top UI guy from Cisco, and uh, actually was at Novell before that. We hired animators from Pixar. We hired uh, top graphic designers. People are saying, why do you need all this stuff at Huawei? You're just building telecom gear. And then we gave it away. And the team basically got focused on developing user experience around cloud, user experience around network management. And the work, uh, one of the best examples was we developed a network management product that's not shipping yet, not even exposed yet, so I won't give you too many details. But we wanted to convince headquarters to fund this as a real project, to build a real product, not just an innovation around it. And we had started the work two weeks before we went to China. And one of the things we said is, well, let's not go there with PowerPoint. Let's go there with a Flash, well, it won't be Flash, an HTML5 mock-up on an iPad. I said, let's just see how that works. Showed up, met with the president of that business unit, showed him this demonstration. It was just network management, but it was cool. It had you know, lots of very interesting user experience focus on it. He got so excited about it, because we were just going to show it off as kind of a prototype at a trade show. He banned us from showing it to anybody and said, you cannot talk about this until we have it productized, because we think this is a huge advantage. And quite frankly, it could differentiate ourselves in the market. Now, he was right. I thought it was a bit of an exaggeration. But the, the reality is UX sells. It excites people. And my point behind this is that that's also where the revenue comes from. The fact that you choose that device and not that device has a profound consequence on the whole ecosystem behind it. It's the reason why one of those companies is the most valuable company in the world, and the other one is kind of disappearing. And it's not because the technology is bad. It's because one of them owns the user experience. Okay? And the last thing I'll leave you with, just a couple of slides on kind of some of the things we've had to go through to evolve. And this will give you a little bit more color on the uh, innovation environment that we've created. First, this is the basic formula we've created to kind of guide Huawei into the ICT environment. First is that we need new competencies. We do not have sufficient competency based on being a carrier equipment supplier to navigate ICT. 
the competencies that we need are we clearly need to hire people that understand the IT world, not just the telecom world, and we've done a lot of that. Our biggest advantage was when Sun and Oracle kind of combined. It shed a whole bunch of really bright people onto the market, and we hired a whole bunch of them. And the reality is there's a lot of brilliant people out there that don't want to work for one company or another, and we're glad to hire them. We needed people that understood the enterprise environment. Enterprises are completely different than carriers. Carriers, you develop a standard, you take 10 years to get there, you deliver something that's stable and grows, grows to the internet size. Enterprises, you hack together a solution to a problem and hope a standard comes later. And the reality is that's good enough. As long as it works, you don't really care about the formulaic approach. It's all about solving the business. Additionally, carriers, the network is the revenue. Enterprises, the network is a cost center. It's an enabler for the real revenue, the real business. Needed new tech competencies, HMI, user experience, cloud, database, IT, I mean, you name it. There's tons that we've been hiring to do this. We need new ICT partners. Uh, we are spending a great deal of time with companies like Microsoft and IBM. You know, there are friends or potential competitors, but the bottom line is they're necessary because in an ICT experience, you're going to touch them. So let's say we win the cloud infrastructure. We sell the infrastructure as a service, as our single cloud solution, and the customer says, yeah, that's great, but I really like that Microsoft Office in the cloud. Well, we better figure out how to make that work on our cloud infrastructure. Otherwise, that plumbing is not going to be very useful with no applications on it. Uh, additionally, we've made some conscious decisions in our cloud architecture. What do you think the interfaces we chose in terms of northbound interfaces for applications? Did we make up our own? No, we chose the Amazon interfaces. They're public, they're open. Why did we do that? Because 90% of cloud ecosystems today are built around things like S3 and EC2 and the technologies that Amazon has standardized. Okay? They're not a proprietary advantage for Amazon. They're open sourcing them, letting people use them. It's just a defined API into their cloud. Makes for a great story to the customer about application portability, about interworking. And to be perfectly honest, those APIs, to lock them down and make them proprietary does not serve anybody. If a cloud only works on one vendor's cloud, an application can never be portable unless you rewrite it, you're never going to go in that direction. We needed to become solution focused, and by solution I mean ICT solutions. We needed to think about how we would build things like, remember that example of the iPad, mobile network, and the enterprise email? Well now Huawei is actually structured to do that. We are the fifth largest provider of mobile devices in the world. We are the largest provider, I believe, today of embedded data cards, Internet of Things, if you will. We are the second largest, second or third largest enterprise provider in the world. And we are arguably the first or second carrier provider in the world. Having all of that together allows us to actually engage at a solution end-to-end -end level. Doesn't mean we're going to build everything, but at least we understand everything and we can operate and cross those boundaries. From an R&D perspective, we needed to think about new operating models. I don't know how many of you care about R&D process, but there's two basic ways to do R&D in the corporate world. One is the methodology is affectionately known as waterfall. Long-term, kind of very much a hardware development methodology. You plan everything. You have a very orderly process, but it takes a long time to execute on that big, complex process. And everything is well-defined before you start. And the other is something called agile. And agile is a bit more iterative. <laughs> It works on rapid sprints. It basically is able to self-tune much more dynamically. It requires a little more compartmentalized group. Um, is one better than the other? No, absolutely not. They're both necessary. At Nortel, I introduced Agile, but not to develop hardware, but just to develop our software more effectively. At Huawei, we're starting to use both. And what you'll find is your choice of development methodology, and you should have a development methodology, <laughs> is as important as your choice of innovation. You know, what's the path to actually execute on your brilliant idea? Is it to randomly run around until you get to the end state, or is it to figure out a logical path to get there? But don't believe that there is one particular methodology that will work for you. There are many choices of methodology. And in fact, in a large company, you may use different methodologies to solve different problems. And at Huawei, obviously, we had to think about bringing a bunch of new tools and technologies and processes into the company. And then lastly, user experience, HMI, was a new skill for us. And I'll tell you the numbers. In the whole company, roughly a couple hundred people were working on HMI out of 55,000 engineers. They're really good, <laughs> but that's not a sufficient answer. And so in FutureWay, the organization I run, the North American R&D Centers, that's what it's called, uh, we have probably proportionally 
maybe three or four times as many HMI or UX people than they do at headquarters. And my goal is to, uh, <laughs> in a not so subtle way, bring HMI and UX people into every development team that touches an end user. Because if you don't think about it from the user's perspective, you are inevitably doomed to repeat what's going on in the cellular world where great technology that the users don't care about just fails. Okay. And then lastly, a little bit about uh, kind of the risks about making this transition for us. Number one, um, we're very concerned about what I call CT pollution. And what I mean by this is, if you launch a brand new ICT environment, um, you know, this, you're going to transition your company, but your entire thought process is as a carrier infrastructure supplier, and you allow all those process and methodology to overcome how you do ICT, you'll fail. And so we're consciously trying to figure out ways to isolate or to protect people doing new ICT projects from the legacy protocols and methodologies that we've been using to build the old products. The old products, are, it's still important to have them, and they're still relevant and important to our business. They pay the bills. But if you try to build a user experience-centered collaboration social networking environment the same way you build a core router, you're probably going to fail. The second, though, is the inverse of that is what if <laughs> you over-rotate? If Huawei decided tomorrow that it was just going to do next generation social networking stuff, we could not make enough money to keep the lights on. Okay? You still have to continue to innovate in your legacy environment. My caution to all of you is you're in an open innovation class. So there's these great new methodologies, things you should embrace. They don't work for everything. <laughs> there are many places where you shouldn't use it. It is as important to decide where not to apply these approaches than to apply where to use them. Ecosystem. If you're familiar with standards bodies, what we realized very quickly is we had a really strong presence. We have, uh, you know, probably 120 leadership positions in telecom standards. We are one of the biggest participants in the IETF, probably the biggest internet standards body. We're the second or third largest contributor in the world. Okay? Very, very focused on this. We've generated almost 50,000 patents, PCTs, and patent applications as a company. We were in the top five of patent producers in the world for the last, I think, three or four years okay, in all industries. But at the same time, when you jump into the ICT world, you're dealing with an entirely new set of standards bodies that don't operate the same way. The major difference between them is over here, you develop the standard, then you build the technology, then you deploy the network. Over here, you find some interesting idea that's already in practice, that somebody's already commercialized and is pretty cool, and you agree that we ought to all figure out a way to make it all work together, and then you develop the standard. Technology is already in place, people are using it, and then you evolve forward. If you think about web browsers, nobody developed a standard for a web browser, the current web browser you use, before you started using it. You started to develop technology and incrementalize it and experiment, find interesting things, and then the standards bodies came together and said, well, maybe we ought to formalize that. Okay. And then lastly is this concept of fear of risk. You know, one of the problems at Huawei and any company that's been executing for a long time is execution is measured based on the successful outcome of every project. In fact, our target in China is about 80% execution success. Don't like to fail. You don't want to have a project that doesn't ship on time, doesn't deliver on the revenue. When you start doing innovation in the ICT environment, you, quite frankly, don't know the answers. Open innovation specifically requires you to experiment dramatically. You test theories. You build technology and throw it away. In fact, I was telling Henry over lunch that, that I had to negotiate with headquarters to kind of agree on, well, what level of innovation should we hit? What's the outcome? And I told him, I said, well, how about this? Uh, for you know, most of our stuff, we'll be about 50% successful, not 80%. And for the really speculative stuff, I'll give you 30%. Now, do I have any data that supports that? Absolutely not. But it made him comfortable that at least I'd have a target that some things would be successful. They wouldn't be as successful as the existing methodology, but at least there would be success. You may discount that, but it's very important if you're going to do innovation that you at least have some target about how successful you are occasionally. Okay? And then I definitely won't bore you with this, but if you want to have a buzzword bingo, one of the things that we've absolutely found out is as you move into the ICT world, almost every dimension from security to cost to intelligence has been redefined. How do you measure profit and revenue in the internet world today? You do it based on eyeballs, click-throughs, those types of things that are ad metrics. In the carrier world, it was based on you know, cost per bit, <laughs> ARPU. Okay? And so I'll end with that and just basically tell you that you know, uh, the point behind this, 
first part was just to give you a little bit of context how real companies I've been at and led R&D have dealt with innovation and have evolved, and hopefully that gave you some context of a few different you know, 20 years worth of stuff. This one is really to say, inside a company as big as Huawei, arguably now the largest telecommunication equipment supplier in the world, it is not sufficient to stand still. The industry around us is changing, and our transformation has to be not just picking a new technology to build, but fundamentally reacting or pro being proactive to an industry dynamic, which we have no control over. You guys have decided that you like ICT stuff. <laughs> we didn't send you on the path of figuring out that an iPad that can do email over a mobile network is useful. You figured that out. But now the industry has to react to it. That reaction will profoundly change how the infrastructure of that industry or that company operates. But more importantly, it will absolutely change the way that you do innovation. The innovation internally clearly will have to evolve with new tools and methodologies. But more importantly, in the ICT world, the innovation has to shift towards more of an open innovation model. Because if you don't do that, you simply don't have enough access to all of the interesting ideas and technology to pull together these solutions. Even Huawei cannot build that end-to-end -end experience that you use on your mobile device today. It, it's interesting because of the ecosystem that's come together. Unfortunately, to date, it has been ad hoc. And so the definition of a successful ICT company in the future will be one that actually has an innovation engine that facilitates that kind of collaboration as opposed to just hope that the end user figures it out. And that can be very exciting and, quite frankly, it was enough to get me out of retirement. So um, anyway, I'll end there. I'm glad to answer any questions. And, uh, Hopefully that was uh, useful. So, good. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. And because we're taping, uh, we want to try to use the mic so we can catch the question. If we miss the question, just re briefly repeat sure, the question. Absolutely. So keep the questions short. We'll keep the answer short. We'll try to get some discussion in the last 10 minutes or so. Questions? It's clear as mud, right? Um, you, one of the first things you said was the, the first step you have to take in innovation is to ask why, and the, and the answers are coming from two ways. One, customers are approaching and saying, we need this, and the second one is the drug dealer yes. method you mentioned. How do you make the transition from one to the other? Uh, you don't. You do both. Uh, honestly, uh, there, there isn't a transition between them. I mean, uh, uh, they're actually two very different things. It, the the need to be constantly engaged with your customers and constantly asking them, you know, whether it's your customers or your partners, anybody else in the ecosystem, if you, if you don't have an open mind to interact with a very, very large audience, you will, you will inevitably miss interesting ideas. And so uh, I don't think you're, you're, the job is to actually figure out a way to replicate customer interaction internally. It is to actually expand your customer interaction, to expand your dialogue outside. And it's not about, it, let, me, let me give you the fatal mistake. You never go to a customer and say, what solution do you want? You go to a customer and ask them, what problem do you have? What is painful? That's the value of that. The second one is more of what is the capability you're missing. And you have to actually deal with it in a very different way. If I walk up to an engineering team and I say, you stink at user experience, I will get nowhere. My approach was not to tell them they stink at user experience, but to say, how would you like a bunch of free resources to do more user experience? Even though I knew they weren't very good at user experience and my teams were better, the result was they said, oh, absolutely. Let, if they're free, let me have them take a stab at designing that user experience. And once they realized that it was important and that they didn't have that capability, then that self-awareness kicked in. And then they started to ask how they could build that capability themselves. So they are kind of different things, but definitely not meant to, be, to imply that you have to go from one to the other. You need both. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, vertical um, uh, integration and how the ecosystem, vertical ecosystem. So uh, in pharma, it's going the other way. We had another speaker um, who talked about vertical disintegration at Johnson & Johnson yeah. because that's the way uh, you create efficiencies. Mm -hmm. But in, in this new vertical ecosystem, when the, once the ecosystem grows and becomes dominant, it does not let innovation in. It kills the innovation. Yes. So how do you, uh, is there a solution uh, uh, in um, your system? Well, well, the solution is that nobody will buy from you if you, if you do that. Um, so, so here's the, 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 big, the big problem people have with these vertical, vertically integrated ecosystems. 
The purpose of them is not so that you can deliver everything yourself. The purpose is that you have expertise at all the necessary layers so that your technology, even if it is a subcomponent of a bigger ecosystem, actually knows how to work within it. And so you'll notice the boxes are not glued together. <laughs> In fact, when we build a network, today we're actually having a lot, of a, lot of, a lot of traction in our cloud business because we have credibility on the network infrastructure. But we may not be able to deliver that network infrastructure because they may be already have an incumbent. But they trust us because we understand both cloud and the network infrastructure. We are starting to get very good traction in the enterprise world, not because our switches and routers are better or worse than anybody else's, but because we also have a multi-billion dollar consumer business and the enterprises are saying, you know, I don't just want to do e-education in the classroom. I want the e-education experience that you're going to roll out for me to work on a bring your own device environment where it's on an iPad or an iPhone. And because you guys are selling millions of those devices, I feel like you speak the right language. So, so, but it's very tempting for people to close the architecture, hence my example of the Amazon APIs. We made a conscious decision that said, even if we decide we want our cloud to work with our applications, because of our choice of APIs, the customer will always be able to feel that they have flexibility. Many of our competitors have not done that. I actually violently disagree with their approach because I think the number one reason people will not adopt cloud is because they're afraid of vendor lock-in and the lack of application portability, not security. Security always works itself out. It's if you feel like you have no flexibility in the cloud environment, it's not really much of a cloud. It's more like a brick. Okay. Yeah. John, um, you've been on the ground floor trying to facilitate innovation within organizations. Is there anything that you found that the government is doing or not doing that is promoted or hindered <laughs> innovation uh, to you kind yeah. of you know, at the ground level? Yeah, it depends on the government. To accomplish? Um, uh, it really depends on the government. I mean, uh, let me give you the Canadian example. Canada is a very good place to do innovation. In fact, uh, they have uh, fantastic both uh, provincial and federal level incentives and R&D credits that actually work very well to basically stimulate the idea that expensive innovation in new spaces is, is, is highly supported. They also tend to be a good consumer of that. The U.S. government, not so much. Um, and the reason for it, I mean, the wrong audience to say this is there is a bias towards academia for government innovation <laughs> activity. And that's partially because we have really good universities and there's a lot of activity going on. But on the commercial side, the government doesn't really provide a huge amount of incentive other than some fairly minor R&D tax credits that, that incent us to do work because of government action. The good news is it doesn't matter because there's so many bright people here. The ecosystems are here. We do it anyway. And you know, we're, we're not in the US as Huawei doing innovation because it's cheap. In fact, it's the most expensive place in the world to do it. We're here because it just works. You have access to people. You have access to ecosystems. You have access to a broad environment. And quite frankly, the original ideas are probably going to come from here first. But the government, I've been very vocal about this, have, has not been an effective partner in my mind in terms of driving innovation in the what's called the, the private sector. In the public sector, they're much more focused. I'm sure Henry can give you his feelings about that. But, but that's, you know, and then in China, totally different discussion. Uh, China kind of leaves us alone, to be perfectly honest. And they do provide good support. And, they do, and they're very much encouraging their technology ecosystem to grow. Uh, but it really depends where you are in the world. And Europe has the framework programs and some other things that are kind of public-private partnership. So it really varies around the world. I, would, I have said this before very publicly when I was in Canada and when I'm here, that the US is probably the least effective at facilitating private sector innovation. They just don't think of it as a conscious thing because they do over-rotate towards academia. Okay. Yes, one question about uh, the global uh, Huawei um, strategy. So the first time I, I heard about uh, um, Huawei was about innovation in uh, emerging markets and yep. in mature technology, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Now that you are, I mean, as you explained, it was part of your inside-out inside out strategy. Now yeah. that you are in front of this huge market in yep. uh, North America, is it still a focus to innovate in mature technology? Oh, yes. Absolutely. In fact, it's actually really interesting. What we're starting to find is it's almost better to innovate in an emerging market than a developed market for a lot of reasons. A real specific example. We are, I think, the largest provider of telepresence systems in China and emerging markets. And we're like number three worldwide or something. I don't know what the statistics are, but we're, we're pretty, pretty high up there. One of our strategic advantages in our telepresence system is the bandwidth efficiency of the system. We use codecs and technologies that basically try to make very efficient use of the network bandwidth. Why do we do that? 
Well, when you're deploying a telepresence system in a developing market that doesn't have robust telecom infrastructure, you don't have infinite bandwidth, so you come up with creative ways to be highly efficient in terms of how you operate. What's interesting is then you bring that into places like the US and Europe, and you have this discussion about OPEX. Which one's going to cost less to operate? <laughs> and the result is, if you can make it work in sub-Saharan Africa or developing China or places that are fairly rural, the odds of you actually having a lower operational expenditure in the North American market are actually quite high. And that, if you don't know, is like 80 to 90 percent of the cost that your customer bears. So we actually like the idea that we think about it. In fact, while my teams are in North America, the vast majority of their customer interaction isn't with North American customers. It's with customers all over the world. I have a guy a couple weeks ago that was in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico. He then went over to Europe and the UK, but mostly in developing markets that are doing fantastic things that, quite frankly, if we can innovate for, uh, usually breeds over very nicely into the North American market as having some very specific differentiation around cost structure, operating effectiveness, flexibility, pre-integration, all of those things which are, are quite exciting for customers. Okay, okay here's our last question. So given this is a class on open innovation, sure. um, and it sounds like you have gone through quite an interesting transition, kind of from the telecom to ICT and yep. from commoditized products to more nuanced products, yep. how has the relationship with your competitors in terms of sharing information changed with that, um, with that particular shift? So <laughs> our, it takes two to tango, I think is the phrase. Um, we, we tend to be pretty open-minded about wanting to work with anyone who wants to work with us. Um, but what I will tell you is wh Huawei, one, we've made this transition probably ahead of many of our competitors. Our classic telecom competitors are not ICT companies today. They do not, they think like bellheads. They think like telecom people. And there's nothing wrong with that except it isn't really, it doesn't really focus on open innovation and flexible interaction with, you know, co coopetition, those kinds of things. And quite frankly, we're a little threatening to them because we've basically broken their markets. We do margin deflation and we do all kinds of things where the only people that lose are the incumbent people who are charging too much for their technology. Um, that being said, on the enterprise side, or I'm sorry, on the carrier side, there really hasn't been a change in our relationship. Were there mortal enemy, you know, we're willing to work with them, they're not really interested in anything outside of their ecosystem other than what happens in the standards bodies. Jump over to the enterprise and consumer side, or the enterprise side especially, totally different discussion. The enterprise ICT experience actually is quite a, a large stack. It includes obviously the people that build the infrastructure like us, but also big players like IBM and Oracle and HP and Microsoft that are playing in upper level stacks. And they all realize they don't build the stuff that we build. And so it's actually been much easier to work with them. We have a great relationship with companies like IBM and, and quite frankly partner with them very heavily. They're a big consultant to us. They help us develop better methodologies. We believe that they have some very, very interesting technology northbound, companies like Microsoft same thing, even companies like Oracle. And quite frankly, we don't want to necessarily do everything they do, and they definitely don't want to do most of the stuff we do. And so as we shifted to ICT, in fact, it's made the relationship easier because now we're all on the same page. We're going after this $3 trillion market. Even IBM, who's a massive company, is a rounding error in it. <laughs> and so you have to cooperate. So it depends on the segment. I would tell you the enterprise ICT space has actually been much easier to establish new partnerships. The classic carrier world is still kind of old school. And to be perfectly honest, even though we're an ICT company now, we're moving in that direction, most of our competitors are purely carrier companies selling carrier stuff to carriers, which is a very different language. Yeah. Let, me, let me just underline one point that John made and then wrap up. Uh, he talked about this vertical integration from the very, very low levels of carrier access all the way to the very high end of what you called north yeah. uh, toward the final consumer and the consumer's experience. And the importance of end-to-end perspective of that. If you're in the telecom equipment market, your end starts and begins, you start at the bottom, but you only move to the middle of the stack. You don't go all the way to the top. If you're in the consumer space, you're at the very top of the stack, but you don't typically go very far down the stack. And in the enterprise, you do tend to go farther up and down, but still you're not touching the final consumer at the customer end, nor are you really deep in the connection uh, in the access space. So the, the real challenge, I think, from this ICT evolution is that you really have to cover a much broader space of value added, not necessarily providing it all yourself, but from a design and an architecture, a coordination and orchestration, you've got to think about a lot of things that your traditional competitors don't even think about. <laughs>
So it's really impressive to see just the, the scope and the range of the transformation, John, that you've told us about. Um, if we did not get to your question, come up and ask us uh, afterward. And if you didn't get signed in, uh, please get my sign-up sheet as well so I know you came. Join me in one last round of applause for John. Thanks, sir. Thanks very much. Thank you. Not a problem. Yeah, that was great. Good, good. Yeah.